That's a big problem right there, guys. Shot. This week on Kentucky Field. Chad, let's light this up right here, man. Can you get that far out? If you've been frog gigging, then you probably love it. And if you haven't, then you're missing out. Next, one key to catching fish is finding structure. We'll see how the department is helping out. Then, deer season is just around the corner. Find out what you need to know before taking that climbing stand up a tree. I highly discourage trying to climb a scaly bark hickory. It's all next on Kentucky Field. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum floated with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> Here it goes! Boom! Oh, oh, oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. When the summer nights get hot and the bugs come out, there's only one thing on my mind, and that's frog legs. We're here in Woodford County tonight, and it is July, it's hot, and tonight we are after what? Bullfrogs. Bullfrogs. You know, Travis, you called up a couple weeks ago, and you were actually college roommate with one of our videographers, Jameson Stander, and said, hey, Jameson, do you guys ever like to frog gig? James's like, man, this is one of Chad's favorite things in the world, and you said, I got a honey hole. Yeah, this is one of our best spots. <laughs> we scouted it for a couple days. I think it's gonna be a productive evening. So how long have you guys been chasing frogs? I've been chasing frogs since I was 16, 17 years old. Oh yeah. It's something I really enjoy, you can do it. There's a, there's a lull between turkey season and dove season, and this is a perfect way to fill that lull. So the goal is gonna be let it get dark and try to fill a skillet full of frog legs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tell you, it's one of my favorite things to eat, and one of my favorite things to do is get out. This time of year, you know, there's tons of fishing opportunities, but if you wanna get out and do something like this, Listen to that. You wanna get out here and do something like this? You know, it gives you an opportunity. It's, it's kinda of like hunting. In a time of year where there's not a whole lot of that going on, you can get a frog gig, you can get your pellet rifle, whatever you wanna do. Grab them by your hand if you grab want. Grab them by your hand. I mean, there's so many different ways to get them. And frog gigging season is a long period of time. You've got from the third Friday in May all the way till October. What's your favorite conditions? for frog gigging. Well, you like it to be hot, you know, unfortunately, you know, a lot of us don't like to get out when it's this hot, but uh, you get a nice warm, still night, good humidity, and uh, get the bugs flying, and that's when you really get into the frogs. Oh, yeah. Well, I tell you what, let's get our gear together and kind of put a game plan, and uh, I mean, <laughs> they're right here right now. We'll get, it, get in there and get after them, what do you think? Yes, sir. Let's do it. All right, let's go. Look at that one right there. Let's try to make a move on that joker. Ooh, big dude. And there's a couple around it, but let's move down here a little bit and we'll get him lit up when we get down on the water edge and try to get around top of him. He jumped. All right, well that should be the first of many chances. There's a couple right there. We'll have to just check them for size. That one right there is for sure big enough. All right, there's one right there that might be big enough. You gotta start somewhere, right? That's right. <laughs> there you go. He's big enough. Chad, let's light this up right here, man. Can you get that far out? 
All right. I believe we got a frog on the end of the stick there. I don't know if I got him or not. I believe you do. Nice. That's a nice little lean out there to grab that joker. All right. I'll tell you what, there is absolutely nothing better. All right, let's go up in these trees. We're gonna find a bunch, okay? You gotta come up on the top side on these. That's a big frog right there, guys. Hold on, don't move it, don't move it. Drive it to the ground. Got him. Wow. <laughs> Dude, that, that was awesome. You, where did you? Barely got him back you here barely on the web. Got him. <laughs> that's a big frog. That's a big, now now that is that's twelve inch frog right there. I think. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> he tried to jump in my pocket. <laughs> that's a good frog right there. Now I saw it go in, and I could tell that it was behind him a little bit. And I saw that splash and I thought, what in the world just happened? <laughs> I guess with the trajectory, I was up on the bank a little bit. I mean, when I Undershot. lunged, I was just right behind him. Nice recovery. This frog almost got away twice. Right here in front of me. Oh, that's a good one there. There we go. Good deal, man. Nice. I feel like a 16-year-old kid right now, I will tell you that. Fun, isn't it? It's just so, it's so much fun. There's something about it being out here. I remember being a kid, you're like, oh, I'm out later than I'm supposed to be, and you're tired, you wake up that next morning, and the second you wake up, heads off the pillow, a big smile on your face. You're like, that was cool, that was fun. <laughs> you got one? Yeah, he's just a little small. We're gonna let him go, but. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I was just showcasing another way to go out there and catch him. Yeah, you can catch him. There you go. All right. Nice job. Nice job, Bruce. That's a good one. Eight foot gig is almost not enough. When they start getting that big broke, no, watch out. When they start getting that big hump in their back right there, those discs get about the size of a dime, you know you got a good one. There you go, bro. Mm. I hear them back on that levee. You know what they're doing, don't you? They're making fun of us. That's right. Because we've been through there twice. <laughs> I say what we do this time, we'll grab my pellet rifle, we'll come up on that bank and see if we can't get down to some of these that are more difficult to get a gig in there. Shot. Nice. All right. I got him right there. Do you see him? I see him. Got him. Whoa. Uh, 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 uh. All right, Chad, he's right there. Good shot. Nice one. I tell you what, the old pellet gun's three for three. Guys, I stepped over right beside this spillway right here, and there's a big bullfrog sitting right up underneath this drain. We're gonna see if I can't come over the top of him and get him this way. I'll go down here and shine him if you try to get on top and see if you can get a shot down. Nice. Yes, sir, look at that shot. Look at that big old white belly on that frog. Wow. Nice shot. Got him. Nice job. Got him. Got him. Got him? Nope. Gone. I thought it looked like it hit him pretty square. I don't know, man. I've missed a few myself. So we gave it a good hour, let it settle back down. I say we make one more trip around it. There's a good chance there's going to be one sitting up here with a headache or a backache or a backache. Hold on, guys. He's right here. See him? You may shoot him again. If you got a good shot on him, go ahead. Got him. I'll tell you what, this is just a lot of fun. I really appreciate you having us out. This has been an absolute blast. Hey, thanks for coming out and hanging out with us. We had a great time.
We're here again today with Lieutenant McQuarrie. Today we're talking about something that's gotten really, really popular, and that's bow fishing. For a person that wanted to get into bow fishing, what do they need to know? First and foremost, you'll need to have the proper license, which is going to be a Kentucky resident fishing license if you're a resident of the state, or a non-resident fishing license if you're not. So even though you're using what's typically referred to as hunting equipment, because you're fishing for fish, you need a fishing license. Yes, sir. That is correct. What fish species are legal to be taken with a bow? You're looking to target rough fish, so your carp, your gar, drum, catfish. What you're looking to avoid to make sure you properly identify your target is not to shoot sport fish. So typically we're trying to avoid the bass species. Bass, crappie, bluegill, none of those can be taken with archery equipment. That's exactly right, Chad. What do you need to know as far as where you're allowed to take a boat and actually bow fish from? That's a good question, Chad. Depending on what you're doing, if you're hunting from land, more likely than not, you'll need to obtain permission from the landowner. If you're on public waters, then there's not much you have to worry about other than if you're below a dam, access points and restrictions on how far you can have a boat within relation to the dam itself. So there's some areas that you're not allowed to take a boat on public waters below certain dams and obviously boat fishing that qualifies, you're still not allowed to do it. That's exactly right because certain areas do not allow you to have a boat period no matter what you're doing within a certain distance of that dam. And those are for safety reasons. So if you've never tried boat fishing, it's something you really need to give a try. It is a lot of fun and if you're an archer, you're going to shoot many times on a trip. It's not, it's not getting a deer stand and hopefully get one chance. You're going to shoot many times every time out. So give it a try. It's a lot of fun. The Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Fisheries Division is always looking for good habitat to hold fish. And this summer, the focus has been on Barren River Lake. So we're here at Barren River State Park and for all the boats that are driving by, they have to be wondering what in the world is going on over there. We've got so much material on the bank that your program is putting this in for fish habitat, right? Yes, correct. This is the first phase of our large scale Barren River Lake habitat project. We've got seven phases planned for this, and this is kind of our, our kickoff project. We're here in Lower Peters Creek, and uh, we got 15 or so sites picked out here, and a lot of this stuff's gonna be centered around bass and crappie structure. Commissioner Knight, we're right here in your backyard at Barron River Lake. You spend a lot of time fishing this lake, don't you? Yeah, I do, absolutely. I have for many years. So tell me a little bit about why this project work is really important to you. Well. With being a fish and an angler here, this at one time was considered to be one of the top bass fisheries in the state. And over the past few years, I started getting reports and things from other anglers as well as fishing the lake myself, and I found that the catch rates were just not what we had been accustomed to here. Mm -hmm. And wanting to keep that same high standard, you know, what do we need to do to improve that catch rate for our anglers as well as improve the lake overall in general? And first one of the things that came up was habitat. Eric, tell me a little bit about why Barron is perfect for this fish habitat project we have going on. You know, Barron's got a lot of good fisheries, bass, crappie, and that's principally what this project is geared towards, are those two fisheries. Not that they're in decline or need it, but this project will help put anglers in contact with those fish. You guys are using some different structure this year. We've been at Cave Run Lake. We did a major project over there over three years. I know you were a part of that as well. Yeah. But this project's a little different. This lake, because Army Corps of Engineer Lake, raises significantly from summer to winter pool. How are you adjusting for that? Because that's got to be a major issue. The bulk of our material at Cave Run was brush material, cedar trees. Without a drawdown there, we don't really have to be that much concerned with the breakdown of the material. It's still going to break down a little bit, but here with the drawdown, we've kind of adjusted and moved towards some larger trees and also some of these plastic products here. You've got to have that habitat present for the angler to come in contact with where the fish are actually locating. When we get that good habitat on the ground and we get the fish using those locations and the anglers knowing where they are, the success rate goes way up. And as well as the fish are more healthy and they have bait fish and other things have places to hide and so that way it turns out well. So you've been putting out structure for years. How long does it take a fisherman to locate those and start catching fish on them? Oh, not long. I mean, those guys will come in right after us and fish it. And now whether they catch stuff, but we may come back even, you know, maybe at the tail end after we've dumped stuff and go over it and there's fish already associated to it and found it. So it doesn't take long at all. So 
So a lot of the materials that I've seen here are things I've seen in the past. You know, you've got the rock and you've got these big yellow looking PVC pipe trees. And we've talked about those in the past. Now this is a little different material here. Tell me a little bit about what I'm looking at here. This is a commercially made product. This is made by Mossback Fish Habitat. It's essentially a, a PVC structure. The reason we're going this route, there's two real reasons. One is that it's really easy to assemble. We like the way these limbs come out. They provide good shade and cover. Also, just being PVC, it's gonna last forever. When the water goes down and this sets out in the sun and the rain and all the elements, this material is not gonna break down like a natural cedar tree would. That's correct. This will last for a long time. Yeah. The texture on this is a little different. It feels kind of rough and that's built to kind of jumpstart that algae growth and we need that to bring in bait fish to utilize these and we can bring in some of the sport fish and that's where this angler component comes in. They can come in, find these structures, fish them and hopefully at the end of the day they got a little heavier bag. Tell me a little bit about the shape of this. They've got these V-shaped limbs in here. This reduces the snagging of lures, which you know I think all of us could use, that's for sure. <laughs> People go, man, this sounds like a great deal. How come you don't do this in every one of our lakes? This is a lot of work. Isn't it's it? a lot of work. <laughs> and it's over many years. But, uh, you know, the department people here have done a great job of deploying the structure. But we didn't just get there by that. We've had a lot of volunteer groups, a lot of local anglers, a lot of other people that have came and helped out assembling all these products, putting them all together, getting them ready to go out and be put out into the lake for all the anglers around the state that want to come here to Barron River Lake. As far as the locations that we're putting structure out today, these locations and what structure is actually there will all be available on the department webpage in a matter of a week or two. Yeah, exactly. So if you're coming to Barron for the first time and you're thinking, hey, I don't know anything at all about this lake, it's a good place to start. Oh, for sure. And these sites will be on and then there's previous sites that we've put in. So yeah, it's a great resource. It's hard to believe that the deer archery season is only five weeks away, and now it's time to get out that climbing stand and test it out. But remember, be safe. The fall is right around the corner, and if you're like us here at Kentucky Field, we're getting really, really excited to start hanging a deer stand in the tree. A few things you need to consider on the safety aspects of climbing and using a climbing stand or using a lock-on stand. We're gonna go through some of the safety issues that we've come up with here. With We got over 45 years of bow hunting experience here in the Kentucky Field Office. And we put some thoughts and ideas together to try to keep you safe this fall and this winter in the deer stand. One of the most important things when climbing a tree stand is choosing the right tree. You can see I've got a tree here that is pretty good size diameter. It can't be too big because you can't get your straps around it and you don't want to climb something too small. And then the most important thing is the bark. If th this bark here is a very firmly attached bark, I highly discourage trying to climb a scaly bark hickory or a sycamore tree or something where the bark is in sheets because you may only be hooked into that tree an eighth of an inch and if that bark decides to slide off, you're going with it and also make sure your tree is in good health. This tree has no dead branches. It is completely alive, full of leaves, and ready to climb. This stand here is, uh, is close to the ground where I can get right in and out. And then the top part is tethered. This is really important. If you ever start the process of going up and down the tree and you don't have your top and your bottom of your stand connected, if the bottom falls off your feet for whatever reason, it's going all the way to the ground. We've got our safety harness on. You want to make sure if uh, you're putting a jacket or whatever on uh, on the outside, you want to make sure that this is easy to get to. I quite often wear a shirt or a jacket over my vest, and I do that for a couple reasons. First off, sometimes I got more clothes on than what I can get on under this vest, and secondly, I don't want this here interfering with my bowstring during the draw. Third thing you see I've got is my pull rope. This is what I'm gonna have my bow and arrow tied on the end of. I have made the mistake in the past of hooking this up down here at the, at the bottom, 
The issue becomes here is you really got to reach over to try to get this, which leans you way out over the stand. You will have a tether on at that time, but it still makes it a little easier if you attach this up here, nice and easy to grab by your hand, and you can pull your bow up. One of the other things that I do recommend is a lot of these bow ropes will come with these clips. They're pretty handy, but I'll tell you, sometimes they can fail. I have had a bow come off and literally fall to the ground. So I like to put an, an, an old fashioned quick little knot on here to keep me from losing my bow. I do not trust these clips. I've got it tied to the cam, make sure my bow string is free and clear, ready to go. Make sure you check and test all of the straps and cables that your stand may come with. You're gonna be setting in the seat. Make sure you test the seat. Make sure you test these cables and straps to these and make sure they're in good working condition. This particular stand here has a cable that is wrapped and has got these knuckles on there. You wanna make sure and test this cable for any rusting. If you see rust on the cable, you can buy replacements. A lot of them even have an expiration date. Now, we're gonna climb in this stand. We're gonna start up the tree. Once you get in and get your feet set, you wanna make sure you apply pressure to the end of the stand and lock it in, and then I'm doing the same with the seat. Now it's time to get the tether. There are a whole bunch of the different styles of tethers. Make sure you read the owner's manual and how to appropriately use your tether. So on this one here, we'll strap it around the tree. We'll attach in here, and this is a safety, safety release. This is used to pop it loose if you need to free yourself. Now, I don't wanna get this too incredibly tight because as I make my way up the tree, this has to go up with me. This particular style of carabiner here has a, a method where you can screw it up and cover the connection point. What that does is that means that you can't bump it and accidentally release this carabiner. And you latch this in and then thread that back up over top of your connection point. That keeps it from sliding open. You do not want your carabiner to open up. So now I am locked in, latched in good. I can slide this up the tree using this release to free myself, go up, and then pull it tight. From there, it's all about getting my feet into the bottom straps. And this one has these hooks and this bungee cord. The hooks for the front of my feet, the bungee cord for the back. It depends on what type of stand you have. This is a sitting climb. I will literally go up, put my, my feet down, slide up, pull back, and make sure that I'm locked in. So now I'm at about the height that I want to hunt at. So the first thing you want to do is to get the distance that you want the top from the bottom, lock in the top, remove your feet, and lock this in real good. Before you stand up or move, you want to move this tether up to about the height of your head and cinch it down really tight. The reason you want this up this height is because now I'm all locked in. If I happen to fall out of this stand, I want this tether to catch me so that I can easily climb back into the stand to regain my hunt. If I, if I put this tether way down here and I fall out, I could be in a situation where I'm hanging too far below the stand to get back in. But now that I'm up here, I'm locked in, I've got my carabiner a little bit away from the buckle. I'm ready to bring my bow up and continue with my hunt. Make sure you get this rope out away from your feet. You don't want it to get wrapped up in your bow as you draw, and you don't want to get wrapped up in your feet as you move around. So now, I would be ready to proceed with the rest of my evening's hunt. Everything's ready to go. I feel safe. I'm tethered to the tree. Everything is good to go. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Here we have six-year-old Hunter Riley with his very first deer ever, a nice buck taken while hunting with his dad. Congratulations. 
Check out the first fish ever caught by Lily, who's two years old. She caught this in a farm pond in Muhlenberg County. Nice job. Here we have a nice picture of Henry Johnson with his first deer ever, a nice doe that was taken in Bullitt County, Kentucky. Check out this nice buck that was taken by Josie LaCron, who's 11 years old from Pendleton County, Kentucky. Nice job. Here we have Dalton Howard, who took his first buck, a nice seven pointer, during the youth deer season in McGolfin County. Congratulations. Kentucky's deer archery season is right around the corner. Now it's time to get that bow out and start tuning it up. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.